Hi, I'm Amy Van Weinsberg. And I'm Noel Sharkey. We are the co-organizers of the Workshop on Responsible Robotics, hosted by the 4TU Center for Ethics of Technology in the Netherlands. And this workshop is done in conjunction with the Robo Philosophy Conference in Aarhus, Denmark. We are here today with Shannon Beller, who is going to talk to us about her own work, as well as what she will be speaking about at this workshop on responsible robotics. Thank you. Um, I am Shannon Beller. I teach the philosophy of technology uh, and ethics of emerging technologies at Santa Clara University in Silicon Valley. I'm the president of uh, the Society for Philosophy of Technology and an executive advisory board uh, member of the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. And my area of research is primarily the influence of emerging technologies on our habits, skills, and virtues. Uh, and so I use a virtue ethics angle to uh, try to analyze the way in which uh, ethical life is impacted by emerging technologies from robotics to social media, uh, to artificial intelligence, surveillance technology, and so on. And on uh, the workshop tomorrow uh, for uh, the Foundation for Responsible Robotics, I'm going to focus on the uh, relationship of moral philosophers to uh, the challenge of developing responsible robotics. And I'm going to focus on the fact that philosophers, uh, particularly in the English-speaking world, uh, have in recent years not been very good about engaging uh, with public policy, mm -hmm. uh, with industry, with actually helping to shape practices in the mm -hmm. world. Even moral philosophers and applied ethicists have found it difficult to cross these disciplinary boundaries. And one of the additional difficulties is that uh, the industry of robotics, unlike, say, law or medicine, where there's a long tradition of normative commitments like the Hippocratic Oath within mm -hmm. the profession mm -hmm. that allows moral philosophy to get some purchase so that we can talk about norms and we can mm -hmm. talk about ethics in the professional context. In robotics, uh, we don't have that firm normative backbone mm -hmm. to, to really mm -hmm. scaffold our efforts on. Mm. And, and uh, I want to think about what kind of models we might use to establish these collaborations under these challenging conditions. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, the models that we might consider run from a kind of consultation model uh, where you have these, uh, these one off opportunities to um, as assist roboticists in thinking about their designs and their mm. practices. Uh, you can think about oversight models that have a, a, a more consistent regulatory structure. Uh, you can look at management models within the organizations, uh, within robotics labs and mm -hmm. design firms, thinking about what kinds of structures in those institutions and organizations uh, could foster uh, collaborations with moral mm -hmm. philosophers. Mm -hmm. Um, but each of these models has their limitations, and so I really want to also encourage thinking creatively about new models mm. for collaboration that might be more productive. Mm. Well, I, I read your book, fascinating read. Everybody should have a look at that. <laughs> uh, do you want to tell us the title? Sure. So um, the book came out this uh, past month from Oxford University Press. The book is called Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting. So in that book, mm -hmm. You, make a, you do a very good job of explaining how virtue ethics underpins other kinds of ethics, and you make that kind of distinction. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that to, the, to our, our watchers? Sure. So I look at, in the book, virtue ethics from a variety of cultural angles. I look at traditional Aristotelian virtue ethics, but I also look at virtue traditions in Confucian moral philosophy and in uh, Buddhist thought. Uh, and I try to draw on the fact that uh, there are some deep commonalities in these different virtue traditions, even though there are a lot of cultural differences in their mm -hmm. visions of what a good life is or what a good mm -hmm. person is. Uh, but they, they share a very um, a robust core of ideas about how people become good and how people cultivate uh, their moral selves to be able to develop the kinds of skills and capacities that allow us to flourish in whatever historical and cultural context that we find ourselves in. And what I argue in the book is that these are exactly the kinds of things we need to be thinking about now as we're entering a very uh, rapidly changing technological context that's placing enormous pressures mm -hmm. on traditional moral norms and practices. And we need to have 
the ability to build up our moral skills and capacities to adapt to these new and changing situations. And that's what virtue ethics is uniquely good at. Virtue ethics is about how you are able to live well even in a context where you don't have a pre-fixed uh, pre, uh, uh, rule that will um, <coughs> tell you exactly what the right thing to do in that situation is. So it's about the kind of creative moral thinking mm. that allows us to handle unstable, uh, rapidly changing or novel moral context. And that's pre precisely the context that humanity is finding itself in increasingly. But could I ask you just before Amy asks you a question, could you just get the to us, you, you make a claim there that without uh, virtue ethics, the, you couldn't have utilitarianism. Well, my argument is that utilitarians still have to talk about the kinds of moral skills and capacities that allow someone to apply a rule or a principle effectively. And virtue ethics, uh, tends to assume that moral rules and principles are a layer of ethical life that are laid over the basic structures of moral virtue and skill. And so when we come up with a moral principle like the utilitarian principle, what we're really doing is articulating a rule of thumb, not a fixed universal law that covers every possible case or tells you the right thing to do in every possible situation, but a general rule of thumb that sums up habits of moral action and judgment that have allowed people to flourish in many contexts. Mm -hmm. So my argument is that there are cases in which a utilitarian analysis can be very helpful, maybe even the best way to think about a particular kind of problem, but underneath that, is still the supporting structure of human moral character, mm -hmm. and that's what virtue mm -hmm. ethics describes. Yeah. I wonder if you could go back to the idea of the, the role of the moral philosopher as well, and sort of paint us a picture of your ideal perspective of what, what should the moral philosopher be doing? Uh, is it about promoting a certain message? Is it about educating, engaging people? What yeah, you tell that's, us a, more? that's a good question. And I, and I do think that moral philosophy, um, and philosophy more broadly, has lost its way a bit hmm. in a contemporary society. And there's a long tradition of moral philosophers being engaged in the world, in political life, in mm. its institutions, mm. um, from Socrates and mm. Aristotle and Confucius, were all involved in speaking to leaders, speaking to uh, experts in society, mm. speaking to people who had power. And what they tried to do is ask the kinds of questions and engage in the kinds of dialogues with those in power that would, on the one hand, expose pretensions and illegitimacies in claims mm -hmm. to power, claims to authority, but would also enrich the perspective of those in authority who are willing to listen to these kinds of critical right. inquiries. And I think moral philosophers should reclaim that heritage and that mandate of being able to engage fruitfully mm -hmm. in conversations with people who have the power to make the kinds of decisions that affect people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I think philosophers, uh, particularly in the English-speaking world, for some time have been very comfortable, far too comfortable, uh, remaining within you know, the classic ivory tower mm, right. uh, 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 model of speaking only to other philosophers and sort of staying above the fray and in engaging in a kind of intellectual practice that while it may be very internally impressive, doesn't necessarily speak to the human needs that are really pressing upon us at this moment. And mm. I would like moral philosophers to come back to that vocation mm. of responding to pressing human needs, of justice, mm. of goodness, of human flourishing. Wonderful. That's excellent. I love That's it. Really yeah, well a put. call to the moral philosophers yeah. out there. Yeah. Great. So th thank you very much, Shannon. That's thank been you. Really fascinating. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. excellent. And uh, I hope, thank you, viewers, as well. And I hope you enjoyed that.